Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Thank you, Bruce, for praying for us today. For those of you who don't know, my name is John. I'm the student and young adult pastor here at Waterbrook Church. I'm really thankful and really excited to be able to open up God's word with all of you this morning. It's a, it's a huge honor. Those of you who are online, I want to welcome you again this morning. Uh, I do pray for all of us that we would see something more of the glory and the beauty of Christ this morning, that we would be captivated by a big grand vision of who God is and what he's done and what he's going to do and that our lives would be transformed. The word of God is powerful and can change us. It's like a sword that cuts right to the very fabric of our being. So that's my prayer is that today that as the word is read and as we get to sit under the word that we would see the beauty and the glory of Christ in a profound way. As we're celebrating uh, Christmas right around the corner here, we're thinking about Christ's first coming. Today we're going to be in Revelation 21 and we're going to look at his second coming. And we'll see that these two are intimately, intricately connected. The second coming is good news because of Christ's first coming. And so today we'll, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, all the way at the end of your Bible. I think it was Francis Schaeffer who said, the beautiful thing about the Bible is that it begins at the beginning and it ends at the end, <laughs> which is true, which is great. So we're continuing in our series, All is Calm, All is Bright. As many of you know, as a church, we participate in what is called the fighter verses, it's an annual Bible memory plan, like Bruce had just talked about as he was praying, where each week there are new verses to memorize. I just want to encourage you in this right now. If, if you haven't purposed to memorize scripture before, there's probably nothing greater that you could do moving forward. I encourage you strongly to hop on board with this fighter verse program and start memorizing verses every week. It is one of the greatest, most rewarding disciplines that you could ever do, to hide the word of God in your mind and in your heart. And so uh, as we continue in our fighter verses, the next few weeks have us in Revelation 21, which is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And so if you, if you want to hop on board with those fighter verses and you want to know where you can get these verses at, you can, there's a couple options that you have. You can download uh, the app, it's the fighter verse app on your phone if you want to go that route. It's a couple bucks, I think, and if you prefer to do things digitally, that's a really good option. Or else you can hop on their website, fighterverses.com, and every week they update with the verses and there's some devotionals to go along with the verses that are really helpful as well. But what I most strongly encourage you to do is connect with Diana Bardo. Every year she makes uh, books, they're called battle plan books. She's got the verses for each week on them with sections to journal and write to help you memorize them. They're available on her website, it's a blurb website. And if you want, if you want uh, to learn where you can order that, she's selling them at cost. And so I would strongly encourage you to get one of her battle plan books, they're incredible. If you want the website, I have it saved on my phone, I can tell you today or when you see her next, you can connect with her as well. All that to say, it'd be a really good idea to purpose to memorize scripture. That's why we're doing this uh, series as we head into the new year looking forward is we believe that there's nothing greater than we could do than to memorize the word of God. And so that's my strong encouragement for all of you today. So for the next few weeks, as I said, we are going to be memorizing verses out of Revelation 21. And honestly, this text is a mountaintop text. The beauty and the glory that shines through these verses are almost unspeakable. And so if you have your Bible, if you haven't already, I invite you to open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We're going to be in verses 1 through 3 this morning. It's all the way in the back of your Bible. It's the second to last chapter. And so would you, with me, read God's word. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. 
about a week and a half ago, I got an email from World News. It was their 2020 News of the Year digital issue. The email made the point that they wanted to highlight all the difficulties of this last year, and they were going to do it by way of retelling the story by way of pictures. And so I opened up this digital issue and kind of scanned through a little bit. And here's the headlines that were highlighted. The first one was a coronavirus pandemic. And so they're recapturing the coronavirus by way of pictures. And the first picture was of a doctor. He had a mask on, he had the shield on, he had gloves on, he was decked out in his outfit. And he was holding one of the thermometers that go on our foreheads, pointed at the camera, and immediately I'm thinking, yeah, I've been there. The next picture takes place in Wuhan, China, back in January. It was a picture of a guy on, on a bike wearing a mask, and behind him in the background, laying flat on his back, belly up, was another guy dead on the ground. The next picture was at a store, people grabbing as much toilet paper as they possibly could. Remember when we couldn't get toilet paper? Then there's a picture of someone in a nursing home with family outside their window because they can't go in to visit. It's terribly sad. Later on, there's a picture of a baseball player with fake fans in the stands, and then there's a picture of a graduation being celebrated in a car, and a student on Zoom with their classmates, and a picture of an empty church with the pastor preaching to a camera. It's been a difficult year, this pandemic. So much gloom, so much sadness. So many difficulties. And then the next main headline was recapping the racial tension that broke out this year. The first picture was George Floyd on the ground with Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck. And then the next picture was someone screaming in fury at a police officer. And then the next picture were burning buildings in Minneapolis and the riots that took place, and then in Portland, then there are pictures of police cars being smashed and statues being torn down, businesses that are destroyed, on and on it went. There was fear, there was angst, there was unrest. After that, the next major headline was the political climate this year. It started with a picture of Nancy Pelosi ripping President Trump's State of the Union address in half. And then there was a picture of the debates. Then there were pictures of the impeachment process there were mail-in ballots and campaigns and there were people celebrating and people angry, more fear, more angst, more uncertainty, more division. And then in this issue, there was an article that was recapping one pastor's attempt to shepherd the church during this time and the division that the church is facing right now. Do we wear masks or not? Do we participate in the racial protests or not? I'm voting left. I'm voting right. There's so much division, so much angst, so much difficulties. It's been a really difficult year. It's been really gloomy. It's been a hard year. Not to mention the unspeakable trials and difficulties that you've gone through this year in your personal life. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it doesn't pretend that everything's perfect. I love how God doesn't give us pie-in-the-sky wishful thinking. I love how the Word of God captures the depths of the difficulties that we face living in a broken and fallen world. There is gloom. There are difficulties. The book of Revelation was written to seven churches in the first century in Asia Minor by the Apostle John. In the first, two chapter, first three chapters of the book, you read about letters that Jesus is telling John to write to these seven churches. What becomes abundantly clear as you read through these letters is that these churches are a mess. They're suffering great difficulties, both inside the church and from outside of the church. For example, the church in Ephesus is rock solid when it comes to defending the truth of God. But in the process of them defending Adopting a defensive posture, they've lost their love for God and for their neighbor, and their mission has been thwarted. The church in Smyrna is 
poor and they feel powerless and they're suffering greatly from demonic attacks, some of which them will even die as a result of following Jesus. The church in Pergamum is living on mission in the midst of a spiritually dark place, but false teaching has crept up into the church and many are being swayed away from the truth. The church in Thyatira was working hard and loving well, but sexual immorality had crept in and it was destroying the church. Then there's the church in Sardis. They have a reputation of being alive. They're doing all sorts of these activities. But Jesus says they're really dead. All of their activities are lifeless. The church in Philadelphia is suffering persecution. The church in Laodicea is rich and prosperous, and therefore they're trusting in their own sufficiency. But in reality, Jesus says that they are poor, pitiable, and lukewarm. And Jesus is going to spit them out of their mouth, out of his mouth, unless they repent. These churches, blood-bought by Jesus, are struggling to walk faithfully in the middle of a broken and hostile world. So the book of Revelation was written to these churches as a wake-up call. Those who are struggling with outside pressures and persecutions are called to endure faithfully, and those who are compromising as a result of the pressures are called to wake up and turn back to Christ. G.K. Beale, a New Testament scholar, he says this, John's purpose in writing is to encourage those not compromising with idolatry to continue in that stance and to jolt those who are compromising out of their spiritual anesthesia. So as we come to Revelation 21, we have to keep this in mind. This was written for the purpose of waking up slumbering Christians and motivating those who are under unspeakable difficulties to press on. The truth of Revelation 21 says this loudly, that whatever we are going through right now, it is not the end of the story. This is not how it ends for Christians. There's unspeakable glory ahead. There is unshakable joy ahead. There's unspeakable peace ahead. So the question for us today, Waterbrook Church, is this. Will you be gripped by the gloom of the world or by the glory of Christ? What will rule your heart? Will hardships and difficulties grip you or will the glory of Christ and his promises rule you? I love how the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this. He says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Waterbrook Church, we are going through, what we are going through and what you are going through right now in the end will be light and momentary compared to the glory that is to come. And so we would do well to look at what this glory is that we are eagerly awaiting. So in our text, we're going to see the glory of the perfected people, the the glory of the perfected place, the glory of the perfected people, and the glory of his personal presence. Look with me at verse 1, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. This vision that John sees takes place in the context of Christ's second coming. The layers are peeled back, and he's given a glimpse of what is to come when the king returns. The first thing that John sees is a perfected place, a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about the new heaven and the new earth, But I used to think that eternal life after Jesus returned was really going to be an escape out of this world. And that we would sort of just float around or something like that. And to be completely honest with you, that sounded terribly boring to me. But that's not at all what our future is like. When Christ returns, he isn't going to snatch us away from this world. He's going to renew this world. He isn't throwing away his good creation. He's going to bring his creation to the perfection that he originally intended. In the beginning, when God created everything, in Genesis 1, it says over and over, and God saw that it was good. It would be a tragedy if, in the end, God's good creation were destroyed. So right now, this world is plagued with sin and corruption. In Romans 8, Paul says that the creation itself groans, waiting to be set free. Sin is like a virus that has seeped into the very fabric of this world. Now, we know that if a doctor were to kill a virus, but in the process kill the patient, that is no success at all. Which means 
that the grace of God in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus goes far deeper than simply starting over with this world. Sin and evil have been so decisively conquered that when Christ returns, this world will not be destroyed, it will be renewed. Eternal life for us is very earthly, which means that every joy that you have now, you will be able to celebrate forever, except nothing will ever again be tainted by sin or its effects, because sin, death, and everyone who rejects Jesus will be thrown into the lake of fire forever. You might say to me, well, yeah, I enjoy boating, (laughs) and it says that there's not going to be a sea. I'm glad you brought that up. What exactly does this mean that the sea will be no more? No more beaches? No more swimming? Doesn't God know that we Minnesotans love the water? (laughs) What does John mean? What does it mean when he says that the sea will be no more? Why is that good news? Why is that glorious? So he's pulling metaphors from the Old Testament. What John loves to do is in the book of Revelation especially, he kind of cuts and pastes different verses and ideas and themes from the Old Testament. He throws them into a tumbler, mixes it up, and dumps it out and gives us a beautiful picture of the hope that we have. And so what he's doing here by saying that the sea will be no more is he's doing just that. He's drawing themes that have unfolded throughout Scripture. And so throughout Scripture, the sea is representative of the place where all that opposes God and his people comes from. For example... In Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, Daniel was a prophet in the Old Testament, and Daniel gets a vision, and it says, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea. So in this vision from Daniel, the, the sea is where the four beasts that wage war against the saints come from. And this is exactly what we have in the book of Revelation as well. In chapter 13, verse 1, it says, John, John now, fast-forwarding to the book of Revelation, says that I saw a beast rising out of the sea. In chapter 20, verse 13, the sea is the holding place of the dead. In other words, the sea represents all that is chaotic, sinful, rebellious, and anti-God. It is the source of evil and demonic realities. Brothers and sisters, When Jesus returns, there will be no more sea. You'll be able to swim all day long if you want, but never again will you have to fear another school shooting. Never again will you hear of child trafficking. Never again will there be pornography or abortions. Never again will you see another 9-11 or Pearl Harbor or Hiroshima or drone strikes. Never again will there be Nazi Germany or evil dictatorships. No more wars, no more evil, no more fear, no more threats. As one commentator said, the removal of the sea expresses the hope of God's people in the final removal of all things that threaten and hinder them from the full experience of salvation. That's good news. That is good news. When Jesus came into the world, he came for many reasons, one of which was to destroy the works of the devil, to triumph over all that is evil. So this says a couple things for us. On the one hand, it says that evil has been defeated once and for all, that the future hope of all who trust in Christ is that at the end of the age, we will finally at last rest from the battle against evil. It's guaranteed. At the same time, This tells us that it isn't until Christ returns that all evil will be done away with. I recently heard someone say that when Jesus died on the cross, he crushed the head of the serpent, but the serpent's tail is still whipping around as he bleeds out. Which means not that we are hopeless and apathetic about evil, but until Christ returns or we die and go to glory, we are in the middle of a battle. We are just like the churches at the beginning of this book. We are facing all sorts of evil and temptations that would lure them away and us from following Jesus faithfully. Jesus is writing to them and, saying, and to us saying, press on. Keep fighting the good fight. Your king has conquered. Evil will be done away with. Waterbrook, do not lose heart. Do not give up. 
When Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated all that would ever stand in the way of your eternal good and the glory of his name. We fight against a defeated foe in the power of the resurrected Christ. We press on. There is coming a day when Jesus returns when, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. A world where the only experience forever will be continual and ever-increasing love and joy and peace because the sea is no more and God himself will be there. And so we press on. But that's not all. Look with me at verse 2. The glory of the perfected people. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The first thing that we need to see are the words coming down out of heaven from God. We will never be able to make heaven on earth. In the end, we will see that this is only and absolutely a gift from God. This is the shape of the gospel. God always comes down to us. We never go up to him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. We cannot produce this ourselves. Even now, Christmas is right around the corner, right? We celebrate God coming down to us in Christ. This is what God always does. He came down to us in the person of Jesus. Then after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended, God came down to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And in the end, the glory that is to come comes down from God when God himself comes down. This is so beautiful. The people of God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When Christ returns with his perfected people, we'll be beautiful. We won't just be good, we'll be gorgeous. We won't just be sinless, we'll be stunning. This is a picture of a wedding. I love weddings. I love how the bride gets decked out. I love how the bride is clothed in a beautiful dress and her hair is all done. My favorite part of a wedding is when the groom sees his bride for the first time. There's so much love. There's so much joy. The new heaven and earth will be God and his, with God and his people. It will feel like romance. Have you ever thought about that? When you think about the new heaven and the new earth, do you think romance it's like the perfect wedding day, forever. <laughs> we, the people of God, will finally be able to receive God's love in a way that we can only imagine right now. His loving eyes will gaze upon us, and rather than hiding in shame, we'll love it. No more fear, nothing to hide, no more guilt. We'll be fully known will absolutely love it. Everyone, absolutely everyone, will enjoy this together. Revelation says that there is a great multitude of people that can't even be numbered from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, and that includes you if you put your trust in Jesus. Everyone will enjoy God together fully. It's a worldwide culture that feels like the perfect wedding that never ends. Love, joy, celebration, feasting, not just with you and God, it's with everyone in God. This is crazy. The bride becomes a city. The city is a bride. John's mixing metaphors again, right? If you track with what he's doing here, it's quite amazing. He's saying that the people of God will be a holy city, New Jerusalem. I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you think about cities in the Bible. Who built the first city? It was Cain, Genesis chapter 4. Why did he do that? He was running from God. He didn't want God in his life, so he created a city to shield himself. Ray Ortland, a pastor, he says this, a city is more than a collection of buildings. A city is a place where people don't have to depend on God because they build other things for survival and thriving. Cities are man-made units of human self-sufficiency. They are a way of avoiding God. This is what God does. 
He takes this mechanism that we have created to avoid him, and he lifts it up, turns it around, and makes it holy, safe, God-glorifying, everyone redeemed, made new and fully enjoying the God who dwells in her. That's a gospel culture. Heaven will be a gospel culture. Right now, the church is a preview of this greater reality to come. We are the bride of Christ. We are a city on a hill. By the power of the gospel, God is bringing people together who have nothing in common with one another and uniting us in Christ, in love and worship. Waterbrook Wright Church right now is a prime time for us either to divide over different opinions about things or display to the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ can actually unite people who are radically different. The church in all her imperfections is still beautiful. The church is the people of God who have been bought by Christ and are devoted to one another. When Christ came into the world, he gave himself up for his bride, Ephesians 5.25. When he comes again, the whole world will be filled with the perfected people of God. This is where he is going with history. So we should be devoted to loving one another as we wait for his return to make all things new. An indifferent attitude towards the church is totally inconsistent with what Christ has done and will be doing. So, if you have a grudge or bitterness in your heart towards someone in the church or other Christians, right now is the perfect time to ask God for the grace to forgive them and love them. This is what God is doing in the church. This is what God will do forever. Will you be gripped by the gloom of being imperfect now or by the glory of the truth that will be perfected when Christ returns? Verse three, the glory of his personal presence. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the pinnacle of glory. This is the diamond by which all the rays shine from. Everything else is like a smoldering wick against the blazing sun compared to this. This is where all the momentum is leading. This is what all of creation has been waiting for, the dwelling of God with man. Graham Goldworthy, uh, author, he said this. He said, these verses sum up and contain the entire message of the Bible. The whole of history of the covenant and redemption lies behind this glorious affirmation. Every aspect of the hope of Israel, covenant, redemption, promised land, temple, Zion, Davidic prince, new Eden, is woven into this one simple and profound statement, the dwelling of God is with man. From the very beginning of time, this is what God has been doing. This is what he has been working towards. This is the original plan of God when he created everything to begin with. A redeemed people to be with his son, to display his glory fully and completely forever. When Christ returns, it will not be one square inch. In the cosmos, it will not be flooded with his personal presence. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as waters cover the sea. You were made for this. You were made to enjoy and worship the King of glory. You were made to enjoy his presence forever. John Piper, in his book, God is a Gospel, he asks this searching question. He says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness, with all the friends you ever had on earth, all the food you ever liked, 
all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict or any natural dis disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? Brothers and sisters, this is the point of salvation. This is the point of the gospel, to be with God forever. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is the good news of the gospel. You get God. This is why forgiveness of sins is good. This is why redemption from slavery to sin is good. This is why Jesus gaining victory over all evil is good. This is why it's good that we are the bride of Christ, because we get him. God will dwell with his people forever, and his people will be with him in his perfect personal presence. As we wait for the day when we will be in his personal presence, we cannot forget the reality and the promises that he has given us even now. After Jesus rose from the dead, he told his disciples, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He promised that when he went to the Father, he would not leave us as orphans, but that he would send the Holy Spirit to dwell with his people. This is the promise in Hebrews 13, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. God is with us in a very real way. We have full access to God and his presence even now. I hope you're beginning to see a pattern here. We look forward to the second coming of Christ when all evil is done away with, and we look back to the first coming of Christ and see that he has already defeated evil. Therefore, while we wait for his return, we press on and fight the good fight. As we look forward to the second coming of Christ when all his people will be finally perfect, adorned as a bride for her husband, we look back to the first coming of Christ and see that he has already gave himself up for his bride to make her holy and blameless. Therefore, we seek to love God and love the church with everything in us. Now, as we look forward to the second coming of Christ when he returns and the dwelling of God is with his people forever, we look back to the first coming of Christ and see that he has already made his dwelling with his people by his finished work on the cross. There is an already not yet reality to the Christian life. And so here is the application for us today as we wait for the future dwelling of God with us. We make it our lives ambition to cultivate a posture of being in the presence of God now. That might sound spooky to some of you, but what I mean is this. The easiest thing in the world is to run around anxious and frenzied. To have your mind erased from one problem to the next, from one person to the next, from one social media scroll to the next, from one news article to the next, pretty soon we realize that we haven't been present with the people around us and we certainly haven't been present with God. We need to slow down. Recently, Pastor Kevin has been sharing with some of us a really helpful acronym, SLOW, S-L-O-W. Let's walk through it. This is a really good way for you to cultivate being present with God and with his people. S, stop and be still. In the craziness of your day, you need to be still. Slow down and relax. L, listen. This is why it's really good to memorize scripture. God will speak to us by reminding us of his word. When things are crazy and hectic, we need to stop and listen. We ask God to speak to us. What is it that God is saying to us in this moment? Oh, open your heart and your hands. We need to stop and be still, listen for the word of God, and then open our hearts to receive what he has to say. We all know what it's like to hear something and then reject it. When God speaks, we desperately need to receive it with an open heart. Lastly, W, walk. After stopping and being still, and listening to what God has to say, and receiving it with an open heart, now we need to walk in light of what God has said. We don't run on to the next thing. We walk it out. This could be taking place as you wake up in the morning and your email box is flooded with more work demands. 
This could take place as you're in the middle of a conversation with someone and they're going through something and you have no clue what to say to help them. This could take place as you watch the news and you suddenly realize that you're being gripped by all the fear and the gloom in this world. This could take place when you're with your family but you're not really with them. This is what it's like to walk and live in the presence of God. This is one really helpful tool. Remember this acronym, SLOW, S-L-O-W. Be still. Listen to God, open your heart, and walk it out. We walk to a different rhythm than the rest of the world. By the grace of God, we need to cultivate a desire in our hearts to live in intimate communion with God. This is what we are made for. This is what Christ died for. This is what our eternal life will be like. God will dwell among his people. Remember the churches at the beginning of Revelation that were struggling? What do you suppose this vision of glory did for them? It put everything into perspective. It woke up those who were slumbering. It motivated those who were growing weary. It put wind in their sails that can last a lifetime. It's amazing, isn't it, that here we are, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the world in small town Victoria, Minnesota, This glorious vision propels the mission of God. The gospel marches on. The church is established and lives are transformed for eternities. Brothers and sisters, this is where history is headed. This is the end of the story. Everything that you go through in your life as an individual, as a family, us as a church, is working towards this end. In the end, for us, it's amazing. No matter what we go through now, The end will be the glory of the perfect place where there's no more evil. Be the glory of the perfected people, finally and fully beautiful and no more sin. And it is the glory of his personal presence where we will see the Lord face to face at last. The question is, will you be gripped by the gloom or by the glory? Because of all that Christ has done, is doing, and will do, this is as good as done. It is guaranteed. As the Apostle Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us this glorious vision of the hope that we have set before us. Thank you, dear God, that your word is powerful. Thank you that you long to dwell with your people. So, dear God, I do pray that you would help us to trust you, help us to love you, help us to long for you. Give us a longing to be with you, dear God. Would you grant us repentance where repentance is needed? Would you grant us endurance where we're growing weary? Would you wake us up if we're being distracted by other things? Dear God, we long to see Christ. We long to know more of Christ. We long for that day when the dwelling place of God will be with man. So, dear God, we ask that you would give us the great, bold confidence that you are for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.